everyone. Yeah. Greetings, everybody. I'm Teresa Reed, and I'm a member of the Bruise and Views Committee for the Ann Arbor Area League of Women Voters. Welcome to Bruise and Views. We're going to give people a few minutes to get settled and resolve any technical issues we might have and grab a brew. It is Bruise and Views. We're all uh, familiar with Zoom by now, but guidance for the meeting is on screen. Um, we're going to review it, but before we do, uh, we want to thank our usual gracious hosts, Pointless Brewery and Theater and Holmes Brewery. They're both in Ann Arbor. And as you know, thousands of small local businesses are going broke right now. So if you can possibly help them out, uh, please make a donation, purchase a gift card, or for Holmes Brewery, you can order curbside pickup. Um, the URLs are on screen. They're at the bottom, well, two thirds of the way down on what you see on screen. So we hope that you'll support these small businesses. So they're there when we need them, when we open back up. We love them. <clears throat> so, okay, so we're all used to screen, um, or to, to Zoom rather, but um, still some tips for engagement. Um, noise control. So everybody's gonna be muted by the host uh, to block extraneous environmental noise. I am not muted, so if my dogs bark, that's what that is. Sorry about that. Um, visibility, this is, we've all probably been on Zoom calls where we've seen people who forget that their cameras are on and do things they don't really want broadcast. So remember that if your video camera is on, others can see everything you do. Um, and um, also if we are recording this event uh, for future distribution, so not just the people on the event, but um, others will see you as well. Um, and we're streaming to Facebook. So you're gonna you know, be visible broadly. If you want to not be visible broadly, you, know, you go to the lower, well, if you're on a laptop, if you go to the lower left corner of your screen where it says video, you can turn your video off by clicking on that. Um, chat, uh, sometimes chat is super fun in Zoom calls. Um, there's a white chat bubble in the black control bar at the bottom of your screen, which you find by scrolling over the bottom. Um, you can type your comment in the little box at the bottom of the chat column on the far right, and then send your comment to everyone, or you can just find a part specific participant. Uh, there's a little drop down menu just above the space where you type your message and just send private chat, which is always fun. Um, questions. We have a lot of questions that people have already sent in for Mr. Rose, which is fantastic. Um, but there's time to ask questions during this um, meeting. So or this presentation. So if you want to ask questions, do it in chat and put them in all caps because that'll help me see them and, and um, shoehorn them in <laughs> to the conversation Rena and Patrick will be having. The um, last thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, the League of Women Voters of the United States is a nonpartisan voter education organization encouraging informed active participation in government. It's the League's position that voting is a fundamental citizen right that must be guaranteed. Tonight's presentation will not necessarily represent the League, but is supportive of community members informing us about their work and various topics important to democracy. Okay, um, we have posted a link to Mr. Rose's document in chat. Um, you can access it there or at lwvannarbor.org, the league uh, website, and that is also posted in chat. Okay, that's all I have for now. We'll be starting in a few minutes, giving people a little bit of time to get, uh, get here, all right? Welcome again. Good to see you. While we give people a couple minutes to sign in, you can also put in the in the Zoom chat your favorite Michigan craft brew that you wish you could, <laughs> you could be meeting at <laughs> that yeah. right now. That's a great idea. And as soon as <laughs> everything gets open again, maybe we will, um, you know, be able to set up the next brews and views at, at uh, your favorite craft brewery. Need to keep them going. 
At one time, Michigan was something like second or third in the nation with number of uh, craft breweries, you know, I can't remember if that was the actual number or per capita, but. <laughs> <laughs> and in case people aren't aware, um, and Teresa mentioned it, a pointless brewery, you can purchase a gift card that when we meet there again, you could use to buy brews or you could um, give to a friend. They, they are a um, improv theater as well as a brewery. And Holmes Brewery is actually open for curbside pickup. So you, if uh, those of you that thought ahead could order, <laughs> yeah. um, pick up your, I don't know. We should have probably well, said, we should have probably sent that. Like pick up it from was, Holmes was, before, you, before you log yeah. in. Pick up at Holmes before you log in. <laughs> um, I see someone has suggested that we go to Wolverine State Brewery and in fact we have nice. uh, contacted them in the past. They do have a, a back room um, that we will hope, hopefully be able to use for one of our programs. All right, I see some questions in chat already, which is fantastic. Some are in all caps, some are not. Um, please put them in all caps. Um, just to help me see them, okay? Because I, we already have a bunch of questions and uh, Patrick is, I mean, has a very thorough, really great presentation for us. So please keep the questions coming in all caps. And just for the people that just joined, we're just stalling for another minute or two and get, we'll get started at 7.10. As you know, we like to do this when we're in the brewery as well because everyone is waiting in line to get beer. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe once again, I actually feel like I wanna, I wanna remind people uh, who've joined uh, recently that everybody's muted uh, right now to um, stamp out background noise except for the speak panelists and Patrick. Um, and also visibility. Uh, if your camera's on, everybody can see everything you're doing. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. It might be fine and it might be um, disconcerting. Uh, we are streaming to Facebook, I believe, and um, we're also recording for future distributions. Right? And you can, uh, well, I already mentioned chat and where your questions go. All right, someone is asking um, how to find the document. Right now, if you scroll to the top of the chat, um, we posted it there. It's Let's also see. about yep. to be on the league's website. The link to the league's website is also in the chat. And then at some points, we'll be showing um, Patrick's document on, on the screen. So, all right, it's 7.10, should we get started? I think we should. So we can drop, Jesse, we can, we have an invisible, amazing um, Zoom master. Uh, Jesse, we can drop the welcome document. Thank you. All right. All right. So welcome again. Uh, Teresa gave our, our introduction. I'm going to give it um, again. Uh, my name is Rena Bash and I'm another member of the Brews and Views Committee. And I just want to remind everyone that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan voter education organization encouraging informed active participation in government. And I know that I am preaching to the choir when I say that. <laughs> All right. The League's position is that voting is a fundamental right that must be guaranteed. Tonight's presentation will not rep necessarily represent League positions, but is supportive of community members informing us about their work and um, educating us about various topics important to democracy. So, as you might imagine, I am very excited to introduce our guest, Patrick, Patrick Levin Rose, to talk about this very important topic. Um, saving the post office, the U.S. post office. Uh, Patrick Rose is a, a highly qualified appellate lawyer. He has assisted businesses, municipalities, individuals, and other lawyers by handling complex litigation and appeals for 31 years in civil and criminal cases. Mr. Rose received his bachelor's degree from Harvard University 
and his Juris Doctorate from the Georgetown Law School. He served as a judicial clerk to a Michigan Supreme Court justice from 88 to 1990. And then he clerked for Judge Colin Seitz of the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit from 91 to 92. Mr. Rose has represented clients in numerous appeals in the Michigan Supreme Court and in the Michigan Court of Appeals. He now works at the MSU Center on State and Local Government and Finance and Policy. He is working on projects related to adequately financing local governments in fiscal distress, repealing and replacing the emergency manager law that we have here in Michigan, and financing water and sewer infrastructure and essential local government services. Now that was the formal bio, but I want to tell you some more things about Patrick. <laughs> we only have an hour and a half, Rena. So okay, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> I will. So Patrick has also been extremely generous with his time and expertise over the years, volunteering for nonpartisan reform efforts. Um, he was part of the policy team that came up with the redistricting reform constitutional amendment that we all fondly know as Prop 2. Um, I met Patrick while volunteering on that committee and was immediately impressed by his deep knowledge about a whole range of legal and societal issues. Um, and so he's one of those people that can synthesize information from a wide range of sources. I predict tonight um, that we will hear recommendations for more than uh, one or two good books to read. So with that, um, as, as before, we're going to give Patrick a little, an opportunity to make some introductory remarks, but then uh, he wants us to move into a more of a conversational thing. And so we will, we will start with all the questions that league members have submitted ahead of time and then go from there. And um, Patrick has assured me that it's okay to interrupt. And so uh, Teresa and I will do that if necessary. So Patrick Rose. Thank you so much, Rena. Um, and thank you for this invite. I am grateful for the chance to think about these issues because I am desperately afraid about the November election and that it will not run the way a good, well-run election should. And the reason that I'm afraid is that this reform the League of Women Voters pioneered in Prop 3 gave us absentee voting without needing an excuse. And we now are part of the majority of states that allow citizens to vote by absentee ballot. Um, there are 29 states that have that where you are entitled absolutely to send in your ballot. Um, there are five states, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Utah, and Washington State that conduct their elections almost entirely by mail. One of the things we're gonna talk about is the bill the House passed on May 15th. And it says that the federal government will make it a policy and provide the money to support voting by mail. If the United States Post Office in its current funding crisis suffers service problems, is unable to make daily delivery, we will have an existential threat to vote by mail. Um, my suggestion to all of us is that we care about the post office for a whole lot of reasons. I view it as a pillar of our democracy. I view it as no less important than having good roads and good schools, free public libraries, but I think one of the um, aspects of the debate that we're having in Congress over the post office is that it's highlighting the um, importance of the post office at a time when we absolutely cannot do without it. And the risk of it failing or being shut down or privatized is be being used as leverage to fight battles that have been going and raging for 50 years. So I worked for Senator Regal in 80 and Senator Levin in 88, and this battle goes to the Senate. So I sat down and I said to myself, if I was gonna meet with all the different groups that are lobbying on this, what would I write to the Senator? And how would I then encapsulate all the views of people that sat down with me making arguments for privatizing the post office, for not bailing it out, for not loaning it money on an emergency basis? Um, and I know if I had to write a memo like that to a senator, um, the first person I'd call would be Senator Gary Peters, because he's the ranking Democrat in the Senate, on the Postal Committee. He's taking the lead on this. We are in Michigan, which is a state that's going to have statewide absentee voting for the first time in a presidential election. 
a lot is at stake. And one hour ago, the New York Times, I want to start with this. I want to start with an example for why we care about the post office from an hour ago in the New York Times reporting on President Trump, Trump's tweets today and Jocelyn Benson's response, because it's directly to the issue we face in the debate over funding the post office. Uh, President Trump tweeted in the New York Times reported an hour ago um, that President Trump attacked the Secretary of State in Michigan for offering for saying that she will send out to every Michigan voter who's eligible an application to vote by absentee ballot. And the president sent out a tweet that this encourages voter fraud, that it's illegal under Michigan law, and that he's going to cut off funding to Michigan because um, this attempt is being made to put absentee ballots in the hands of voters for the November election. Now, this ought to concern everyone who studied the results of our May 5th local elections, because 99% of our Michigan voters voted absentee. We can expect that number to hold in the November election. And as the New York Times reported in, in Nevada, where a Republican Secretary of State is doing the exact same thing as Jocelyn Benson, sending out applications for absentee ballots, um, there's a bipartisan recognition that this is essential to a fair and free election. And in fact, Jocelyn Benson tweeted back to President Trump today, and there's a report on this in the New York Times from an hour ago, that Michigan isn't alone and Republican governors and Republican secretaries of state are doing exactly the same thing she's doing, which is sending out absentee ballot applications in Iowa, Georgia, Nebraska, and West Virginia. She gave those as just some examples. I think it's gonna have to happen in the entire country because of the risks of people getting ill if they have to vote in, by, uh, in person. We know 53 people got sick that we've documented in Milwaukee from having to go vote in person in the midst of a pandemic. I was doing voter protection in East Lansing and walking through a hallway that had over 280 people waiting for three to four hours to vote. That line got reduced to two hours later in the afternoon. But the point is people will make the decision not to vote and they'll do so in dense urban places uh, population areas, but they'll also do so in rural areas where they're not set up to handle social distancing. So the question becomes, what happens if we can't do vote by mail? Um, yesterday in the same 24-hour news cycle, this is my other opener for why you should care about the post office, and then we'll launch right into the funding crisis. A federal judge issued an order saying that um, there's a constitutional right uh, under the U.S. Constitution to be able to vote by mail if you are um, susceptible to COVID-19 and don't have immunity, if you have a special uh, risk, and he based that on the uh, 26th Amendment that prohibits age discrimination, the First Amendment, uh, there's another case pending that would grant the right to vote by mail in Texas based on disability status. So um, my guess is that there will be funding and an effort to use absentee ballots um, across the country for vote by mail so that we have a fair and free election in November. The weak link in this chain is if the Postal Service is not able to handle the current demands in the midst of the crisis that it face, faces because of the pandemic and also because of the structural budget crisis that Congress created in 2006. We're gonna talk about both. Um, currently, the crisis exists because one third of the mail volume has fallen away which means that the Postal Service is losing $13 billion that it needed to balance its books. Uh, the current Postmaster General, Megan Brennan, said that the Postal Service will be out of money by September, and without at least a $13 billion appropriation, they will suffer an inability to deliver the mail in a timely way. Right now in Detroit, in, as of mid and late April, and then into, um, into the beginning of May, much of this was solved, but they were down to delivering every other day. They had a third of their staff not able to work because they were under quarantine. There were service delays in the processing uh, plants as they converted over to deep clean and got the supplies. Um, and so there's a variety of reasons why the Postal Service faces this need for the same kind of bailout that, they, that the rest of the country has been going to Congress and asking for and yet the Postal Service did not get the bailout that it asked for. In the first four uh, stimulus bills that Congress passed, the, there was a bipartisan consensus to give the post office additional stimulus funds. That's because the Board of Governors, which is both Democrat and Republican, voted unanimously to ask for $75 billion 
um, which would be $25 billion to cover the shortfall from people not sending mail, from businesses not sending bulk mail. Even though there's an increase in package delivery, the revenue shortfall in the first 18 months of this crisis will be $25 billion. So the Board of Governors voted to ask Congress for that amount. And a bipartisan consensus existed in the House and the Senate in the third major stimulus bill called the CARES Act that passed on March 30th to give the Postal Service all of the money that it asked for. And within two days of the Senate agreeing to this basic piece of the formula, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and then President Trump said uh, they would veto the bill if it had any bailout for the post office unless the president's full privatization plan was on the table and part of the reforms. And he gave a list of the reforms that he was demanding as a condition of any money going to the Postal Service. And he referred back to a Treasury report from 2018, which we'll talk about, and an OMB report, which we'll talk about, that asks for cuts in the service, the hours, raising the rates on mail and raising the rates on packages, cuts in pay, cuts in benefits, and full privatization and getting rid of the mandatory universal service that makes the post office unique and which for the entire history of the country, it has been part of federal law that the US Postal Service serve every community, every one of the 42,000 zip codes every day at uniform rates. So the president and the treasury secretary put on the table a demand that raises up a debate that's been going on in this country since the 70s and really heated up in 1985. So at the very moment that the United States Postal Service is performing a more vital function than it ever has, notwithstanding the fact that I would suggest to all of us we figure out how central the post office is and how much it allows for state and local government to function, for commerce, for households, for the medical system, for the courts, when you look at all the things that the post office does and you understand how it has been able to function at reasonable cost with the highest rankings in the world based on the Oxford study, which we can walk through, meaning it's got the most efficient and reliable delivery based on metrics that added up all the postal systems in the world and measured them against these nine metrics. It's got a more reasonable cost. It's inflation adjusted. It can't charge a profit above inflation and its costs. And so when you look at what the Postal Service accomplishes and then you put the Postal Service in the middle of a pandemic and then you ask yourself, how will absentee ballots be returned? How will census forms be returned? What would delays in any of them going through the mail mean? What about 90% of military veterans who send their test kits to know if they um, got COVID-19 and need to know immediately? Uh, and there's usually two mailings involved in that. Um, what about people who pay their bills by mail? That's 45% of Americans and a bill doesn't get paid and then they face a very drastic consequence. You can walk through all the things that the Postal Service does and then ask yourself why in the midst of a crisis would we allow for all of these other issues to get worked out that are structural and long-term decisions about the post office that have been debated for 50 years. And I would suggest to you that it's been a plan for a very long time to create artificial debts for the Postal Service so that it would face this type of a crisis in order to break the log jam in Congress. And the dynamics have been for quite some time that the stalemate and the deadlock within Congress has made it impossible to solve the question of are we going to restructure the Post Office and change its mission so that it does not have to give universal service at affordable rates that are uniform? Are we gonna allow them to charge more for remote rural areas? Um, what are we gonna do about the unions? Are we gonna make changes to the fact that the post office has collective bargaining and a public union like no other agency and has since 1970, which has been a target from the moment it was created? So my, um, my talk and the questions that we've come up with all relate to this. And I've gone and learn the history of the post office, which I didn't know. I didn't know it predated the country's founding. I didn't know that we have a country because we were able to establish these postal roads during the revolution. 
and send out pamphlets that had the actual text of the Constitution on it, that the Federalist Papers went on these postal roads. I didn't know that we subsidized newspapers so heavily and that we had a wider readership of a broader number of uh, newspapers, anywhere from five to seven per city, typically, with from all points of view. I didn't know that because of that, we got some of the highest literacy rates in the world. Um, and I didn't understand that without the post office and the postal roads and the way that the post office grew, that rural communities could survive and thrive and stay connected to urban areas. Um, and I didn't understand the, the depth and the reach of the post office. I didn't know that it had 47% of the volume of the mail worldwide. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how many zip codes there were, how much real estate there was. I didn't know it was the largest employer after Walmart. I had no idea that it was able to pay its bills, that it did not have an operational debt, that its revenues covered its costs, and that the only debt structurally that it's faced is a debt that Congress imposed on it in 2006 to fund retiree health. I didn't understand that that was an artificial debt, that it was mistakenly imposed, and that ever since it's been imposed, there have been efforts to change and repeal it. I didn't realize that that came from design flaws in how the Postal Service was converted over from a public agency in the cabinet that was heavily subsidized from 1844 to 1984, right after the postal strike. And in 1970, they made it a government corporation. And they mm. made it pay as it went, cover all of its own bills with its own revenues. And it took to 1984 till it could start to do that. And the flaw in the structure that was created is that Congress could control it. Congress could control how it decided to uh, cut its costs. And they kept a lot of postal buildings open that should have been closed. Congress could decide um, whether it could go into new and different areas and innovate and keep up with the internet revolution, which it couldn't because Congress kept it out of digital mail and internet mail that other major postal systems have gone into. So that charter, which uh, made it a corporation, made it pay as you go, had this design flaw. And most of the 2006 uh, Port Accountability Act problems relate to the transition to a government corporation, a public wholly owned corporation, because they had their own pension and the government was overfunding the pension. And so the Postal Service had to pay the federal government back. And so they used the retiree pre-funding to require them to pay 75 years in advance for every employee, born, even for not born, using actuarial um, approach that put on its books a $5.5 billion debt starting in 2007. And that debt has never been paid. So there have been continuous loans. It was designed to repay the federal government for overfunding the pension in this conversion. Now, this might sound like it's down in the weeds, and this might sound like it's um, you know, very complicated, but uh, the way to think about it is that because this paper artificial debt has been created, there has been a messaging about the post office that it's failing, that it can't pay its bills, that it hasn't survived the decline of regular mail in the internet age, even though package delivery has gone up dramatically, so much so that as package delivery increased, because of the internet, what the internet took, the internet gave back. And as of 2014, 2015, 2016, they were running $600 million surpluses. Six out of the set last mm -hmm. seven years, the post office has not had a fiscal crisis. So, so, so my questions. last point is that Congress, oh, okay. Congress created this crisis and now we have a partisan log jam and deadlock at the point in time where we need this issue to not be partisan. And I'm very much afraid that the reasons why Congress should do what it did in 2007 and eight, when we had a Wall Street financial collapse, we had a decline in mail volume, the regular mail delivery went down 17% and they lost 17 billion. They got a $17 billion bailout. They were back to their normal volume and out of the problems by 2011 and they paid the money back. That's what needs to happen here. And if it doesn't happen, it's because people are working out an agenda to force full privatization, 
break the union, get rid of collective bargaining, and sell the assets of the public uh, trust that the post office created to private interests, put their pensions into index funds, just like was debated with Social Security. That's one of the major targets of this, to force the federal government to put private developers into its buildings and lease from them. Just like when they partnered with Staples and now partnered with Wall Street, the Staples franchise partnership was, was um, ultimately killed by the union fighting it and consumer groups joining together because that would have cost more and we would be paying to lease buildings. They've gotten on a temporary basis into all the Walmarts and they're calling that going postal with a slam at postal uh, workers as if they're crazy mm. people in their branding because they're trying to attack an institution that serves us well. And yet Americans support the post office and they have supported it on a bipartisan basis. The Gallup polls and the Pew polls show the support is the highest of any agency, over 90%. Its support is strongest in the rural areas and there is very strong Republican support for the post office. And there is support for these privatization plans in both parties. So I think that's my opening. That's my launching off point. Yeah. So All right. Thank you. Can I, can I take one question from um, chat, Rena? Um, yeah. But I, first, I want to, um, I just put a link in the chat. And I'm also going to briefly uh, remind everybody. So Patrick has created a document for us that is, um, basically runs through, I'm going to share it on my screen briefly, and then we have put a link to the League's website so that you can actually um, go take a look at this and you can see all the points that Patrick is going to try to cover with us this evening, as well as all the references that you can go um, find out more information when when this is over, or if you're somebody that likes to read along at home, you can open it on your screen and, and do that as well. So thank you. With that, we are gonna move now. We have questions that uh, league members have submitted in advance, but it sounds like Teresa's gonna take one from the chat right now. Well, just a quickie um, to ask if the, so the, the Postal Service was asking for 25 billion. It got 10 billion, right, in the CARES package? So the, the CARES package, billions. let me let me clarify. Um, Thanks. Let's, let's, let's break it down into three piles of money, 25, 25, 25, each with a billion behind it. Yeah. And then let's talk about the loans because it needs both money and cash and to borrow money. And they're separate, one's a loan and one's just straight cash. Okay. So in the CARES bill, they got zero dollars in stimulus money, nothing. They're the only ones that got nothing. Notwithstanding mm -hmm. the fact that there were four bills passed and notwithstanding the fact that there's almost four trillion dollars that was given out, they got nothing. Mm -hmm. It's rather unusual given the importance of their claim. If you want to say they're less important than 140 billion to state and local governments, that's fine you can make that argument. But then when you look at the fact that $500 billion was given to private corporations, including the airlines and the cruise ships and lots of retail stores and things that are not as essential, many of whom are facing bankruptcy, it's very hard to justify giving them 500 billion and then tying that to Federal Reserve funds that are gonna be loaned with the 500 billion being the anchor, like the, the money down on the house loan of 4 trillion. Four trillion with a T. Four trillion that the Treasury Secretary, in concert with the Federal Reserve, is going to loan to private corporations. So the Postal Service asked for a loan. They needed to have their loan limit raised so they could accept the loan because they were at their loan limit. And then they needed two kinds of loans one to um, guarantee that they could pay their bills, and one to cover. Um, they have to upgrade their fleet they ha and they have operational capital investments that they have to make on their buildings. Mm -hmm. So they needed the $10 billion and there was an absolute bipartisan agreement to give them that emergency loan. They did get that emergency loan or they would face bankruptcy, but they didn't get that loan until there was a knockdown, drag out fight 
where the president said they're not getting the 10 billion loan unless they quadruple package rates. Quadrupling package rates would be a massive tax on anyone who takes an Amazon package because 50% of the Amazon packages go through the US mail on the last mile of the delivery. They just get delivered by Amazon. They would pass that directly through to the customer. Right. Uh, UPS has been broke for the last 12 years. It's not, I mean, it's, it's gone in and out of being solvent. It's had to continuously borrow money. It's shipping US Postal Service mail in its day flights and at night it takes its own, its own um, cargo in the planes. And so it is a provider of basic service to keep the US Postal Service running. Post office needed to be able to pay UPS. If you quadrupled package rates, UPS might go out of business. Mm -hmm. um, FedEx is in the same boat. FedEx is delivering quite a bit of its stuff to the U.S. Postal Service. So the president insisted on quadrupling package rates. He held up the bill. He finally, at the end, backed off because they needed to delay this fight for another day. And they couldn't afford to have a creditor come along and force the Postal Service into bankruptcy. And notice that that's what we're really facing because Rand Paul, every time he gets to a mic in the Senate, says, I want to force the Postal Service into bankruptcy because that's his way to get to full privatization. And Connecticut U.S. Senator James Buckley was saying that in the 70s and the 80s. And President Reagan mm. spent all eight years of his presidency trying to sell the post office. And he didn't succeed because Republicans in the House and the Senate opposed it. So this has a long mm. history, which we can go into. But no, the post office didn't get any money. And they got the $10 billion loan with no conditions but they need another uh, loan of that amount and to have their uh, loan limit raised. Right, okay. Yeah. Rena, you wanna? So, sure, um, so this gets to some of the questions. Uh, I'm gonna lump a bunch of questions together that really concern this sort of business operation um, around the post office. Um, you, you've answered some of these things, but I, I'm going to just read questions that people submitted so that we can all hear what each other was thinking ahead of, of Patrick's talk. And then, um, Patrick, you can, you can address them. So the types of business operation questions that people had are, if not the USPS, where would we, you know, where would all the letters go? Um, someone else said, I get scores of advertisements and requests for money and almost everything I would consider junk mail. Is that the bulk of the USPS business? Um, other people wanted to know um, if companies with the large online platforms such as Amazon are already using the local post office as mini hubs and with USPS already delivering those, those final leg shipments, is USPS actually being appropriately compensated for that service? So those are some of the business questions that people asked. So let's take the bulk mail question first because the postal union is attacked for constantly wanting to promote the bulk mail to keep the postal service afloat. Um, if you go to section 17 on page 13 of my outline, you'll see the operating revenue from 2019 bulk mail marketing mail is $16.4 billion of total revenue of $71.1 billion. So it's the third lowest in the total amount. Mail, first class mail is still $24.4 billion in revenue. Um, and shipping and package services are $22.7 billion. Periodicals are only $1.2 billion. So yes, it's an important part of a three-legged um, tripod or whatever of the funding structure of the post office. Um, going to the package delivery, there is a wonderful discussion in the Treasury report and the Office of Management and Budget uh, a report, both of which are online. Um, OMB works for the president in the White House, and that was July of 2018. And then Treasury Secretary Mnuchin issued his report in, in December. Um, and I read them both. They're both very long. But they get to this package delivery question, and they don't really answer it because they don't have the data to show that the US Postal Service is getting below market rates. And they proceed to acknowledge that um, the Postal Rate Commission could seek an increase and has sought an increase within federal law and has been granted increases. And they go through the history of those increases and the increases have kept it to the rate of inflation. Now, the thing that um, the Postmaster General said in her report 
and the inspector general in response is that there's absolutely no basis to show that Amazon or FedEx or UPS are being subsidized. And they go into quite an interesting discussion about how we have an integrated delivery system for our postal services that is a public-private collaboration. So these are private couriers. They had to be allowed in by lifting the statute that forbid them in 1979. After they were allowed in, they were trying to cherry pick the profitable areas of business and they couldn't get around the fact that there's a monopoly at the door where the post office has to be the one and the only one that puts it in your door. And so they are required to do last mile delivery, but Amazon, FedEx and UPS all figured out that the economics work out to show up at the back of the uh, postal shipping stations and all the major processing plants and have everything pre-addressed, pre-formatted. And they have unified crews with joint work operations and the US Postal Service delivers this last mile. So Amazon, FedEx and UPS argue that they are paying more than their fair share. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that they're having a phony debate. And the phony debate that they're having is that somehow package delivery, which is got a lower profit margin, should be opened up to private couriers, FedEx, UPS, Amazon, if it chose to have its own delivery service. And the answer is that if that happened, they would not deliver in 60 or 70% of the parts of the country where the post office goes, because the post office can do it more cheaply and has the economy of scale and can still earn a rate of profit and that we need to devise a system like the very public system we've got in order to build up a robust package delivery service to compete with it. And that won't survive unless the US Postal Service has some monopoly and some ability to cross subsidize. What that means is when you send a letter anywhere in the country, so I wanna send a letter to Barrow, Alaska, it's 55 cents. Deep in the heart of Mississippi, it's 55 cents people who live in those rural communities would be cut off. And uh, this is the point in time to recommend reading the, one of the books that I read, um, which I recommend, and it's beautifully written, and it was a bestseller. And the name is How the Post Office Built America. And it's by Winifred Gallagher. And what it describes is this fight to make sure that rural communities were not left behind so that they got to have post office buildings built when three-fourths of the country lived in rural areas in 1890. Um, they were going to not participate in the country's commerce if they couldn't get post office buildings. There was a massive increase in post office buildings. 70,000 post office buildings were built. Then they decided they wanted to have home delivery because cities started getting home delivery in the 1880s. It started in 1865, but they continued. And by the 1880s, every city of 10,000, you get home delivery. Um, so they wanted home delivery and sometime between 1890 and 1914, they started to get rural home delivery. The point is that we will have uh, gaps in service and unaffordable rates, and we will not have an integrated single communication ability in this country unless we maintain the postal service with the key elements that are under attack. It has to have enough of a monopoly to charge base rates so they can cross subsidize because urban mail is subsidizing rural mail. There's no way around it. Uh, secondly, it has to have universal service required. And third, it has to have uniform rates and uniform requirements. So one of the reasons we have the best post office in the country, in the world, in terms of reliable and efficient service is because we mandate the same service in every part of the country. We've invested immense infrastructure to fund that. And I'll give you the New Zealand story so you know how it'll work out. Because there's some question whether we can shut it down. Many people think we can't. It would require congressional action to do so. That's why the people who want to privatize it are pursuing the, um, you know, first you knock them down, second you start bleeding them out, and then, you know, last but not least, you walk out of the room while the bleeding, you know, finishes and they're dead. And that's what they did by making it a government corporation, not an agency, so then Congress didn't have to appropriate money. That's why we're in the problem we're in now. So the 1970 Act had that design flaw in the charter. And then Congress micromanaged, 
and prevented the Postal Service from doing all the things that would solve its revenue problems, which all the other Postal Services did. Get into uh, digital mail, uh, secure financial documents, e-post brief where you send an email and it gets delivered as a paper mail letter. And they have that in like nine of the European countries. All of these internet digital based forms of mail delivery, Congress didn't approve. Those would have all been revenue sources that would have made it possible to not ever consider giving up the monopoly, giving up the uniform service, giving up the affordable, reasonable cost, all of which are in federal law. So Congress micromanages the postal service into not being able to innovate. And then of course it put this huge health pre-funding debt load that it can't repay and denied it the right to go back to something we had, which was postal banking offering minimal financial services. Okay, somebody asked about postal banking and I was gonna throw, make sure that you answered their question. Did I answer all three? I did bulk mail. Yeah, yeah, you did. So yeah, somebody no. asked, is postal banking a good idea? Um, so when it was adopted, it was incredibly popular. It was adopted in 1910 and it gave immigrants and low wage workers in both rural and urban areas access to a bank account when they couldn't afford one. Um, most people living today don't realize how traumatized the country was in 1910 about the banks. It's the first year of the Federal Reserve. We had three major depressions from bank failures at that point. This is before the Great Depression. We had three major depressions from bank failures and financial speculation. Uh, people wanted a safe place to put their money. So you had two things going on. People who were priced out of banking had no way to put money, save money. Um, and then the war started and you needed a way to sell war bonds and a way to get people to invest in treasury bonds, a way to get people to save money because that was the big thing that and this is the year before the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918 when postal banking really took off. Um, so from 1910 to 1967, we had po postal banking. You could get small loans, loans that would get you through to the next payday if you were short or if you had a major repair um, that you needed to do um, or a health bill. Um, why we need it now is that we need it now more than we needed it back in 1910. We need it now more than we needed it at any time since the Great Depression. And that's because 30 million Americans do not have access to a bank. And the reason is that under bank regulations, there is no vehicle for low cost banking. Mm -hmm. And that means that if you are at a low income and in this 30 million person group, 10% of your income goes to the cost of banking. It's really a shocking number. Pat, um, Patrick, and, why, why did postal banking go away in 1967? So there was a lobby and it was not a bad reform um, to promote community banks and credit unions and mm. other alternative small institutions. Now, it was a privatization to a form of banking that met the need on those very same terms. Um, but it doesn't take very long for the deregulation of banking and the modernization, all the changes that harm uh, people from access to credit and access to banking are called modernization. Um, the modernization led to the savings and loan sector, as well as community banks, being allowed to make very risky investments. We had a savings and loan crisis, a savings and loan bailout, a re-regulation. The bottom line is that the need that was met between 1967 and the middle to late 80s was no longer met after that. So we've had a 30-year crisis in the making. And the Federal Reserve Bank of Missouri did a study. It's widely reported. Many people know about it. But we have such income inequality and wealth inequality that 47% of the country is in a financial condition. This is pre-pandemic. It's vastly worse now than this statistic from last year. Um, they cannot go more than a month uh, and survive a $400 bill. Right. Um, the one study suggested to get to 40%, it's a $1,000 bill. But the point is that if you don't have access to a bank and a way to get a simple loan, you end up paying 200% to 3,000% in the payday loan sector. 
the total amount of money loaned through the payday loan sector is very, very large. It really will shock you. Mm -hmm. And these are debts that were illegal and criminal when I became a lawyer. In fact, when I first went to the Supreme Court for my very first oral argument in August of 1988, there was an Ann Arbor pawn shop that had charged 10% interest and was being prosecuted for a felony. Most credit cards charge upwards of 18% and the payday loans don't face limits. And because they're nationally chartered, they don't face the limits even under state law. So the problem with postal banking as an issue is we desperately need it. It's one of the things we could do to reduce inequality and increase fairness. It would also be economically efficient. It would promote family wealth. It would promote economic activity, all these arguments, but it would take away a profit uh, center for the financial sector who gives enormous money and there's bipartisan opposition to postal banking. And that's why I didn't make it into the stimulus bill. This is one of the great tragedies of American politics. And if you wanna pick up an issue that would improve people's lives and save the post office at the same time as dramatically increasing the welfare of the poorest people in the country, postal banking would be the way. There's a book which I recommend called How the Other Half Banks. And it's by a brilliant professor named Marissa Baradin, Baradin and he is, um, he's very gifted uh, author. He's testified in Congress. Um, there are quite a few people advocating on this and this pandemic will make this an issue that we will think about and talk about and make front and center. So don't think that because it was dead because of the power of the financial sector that it's dead forever. Okay, we have a we have a few more questions. Pat, uh, Rena, did you do you want to want to do a question? Do you want me to do a question? You want to yeah, alternate? Um, well, I think we want to. Um, yeah, we, we certainly want to squeeze things in. So there was uh, two other big areas that people had questions in. One was kind of government oversight type questions, but the other ones all pertain to the pension issue. So. Um, let's let can we do that one real quick? Let's do the pension sure. issue because that has come up. So, people were asking things such as, can the USPS meet this pension op? There are pension obligations. What was the reason the USPS was required to set aside so much prepaid pension funds, and why won't Congress remove this absurd pension reserve requirement? So. Um I read this brilliant article by Sarah Holder in City Lab, which I recommend to anyone, it's in my footnotes. And she talks a lot about this and interviews the head of the Postal Union. Um, and he's got a great discussion in that article, but they made in that article the very same mistake that the questioner made, which is to confuse pre-funding of the employee retiree health liability with pre-funding of pension liabilities. Those are two separate liabilities. And um, the, the 2006 Postal Accountability Act dealt with the pre-funding of healthcare retiree liability. Now, if you get into talking about pensions or retiree health, the mind glosses over. Um, but the, 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 this is a really simple one, okay? And I like to make things simple as possible. Um, you go into the Treasury report in December of 2018 and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin admits that the criteria for pre-funding retiree health care liability um, in the law in 2006 um, overpays dramatically what's required. That no other corporation, public or private, state or federal, in the United States or in any part of the world, has ever had this kind of a pre-funding requirement 75 years in advance. He said the only basis in any actuarial standards to pre-fund a healthcare liability is to take the people who are going to retire in 10 years and make sure you cover those liabilities. So the article that I mentioned, the City Lab article, asked an even simpler question. Why not in 1984 when they were trying to figure out how to fully transition this agency that always had federal subsidies every year over to being a public corporation that pays out of its own revenue? why not have them pay this liability out of Medicare? If they had done that, we would not be even having this discussion. This would have gone away. And the federal government was looking for some simple, quick and easy way to get repaid on pensions 
that it paid into this private account for this government corporation. It's a public account to cover a separate liability independent of, of Social Security. And they overpaid and they wanted their money back in 10 years. And so they wrote a law to get their money back in 10 years, 5.5 billion. Um, I'm gonna recommend another book that was published last Tuesday on the post office called Undelivered. And you can buy it on um, Kindle for I think $6.99 or $9.99. It covers this in detail. The, the man who wrote it was a, a postal carrier for 20 years. His name is Phil Rubio. He's been an academic for 25 years since then. Mm -hmm. It's about the strike in 1970 that produced the Postal Union's collective bargaining rights. Um, but it discusses this issue and it says that this law was passed in the lame duck session in Congress by a voice vote with no committee hearings, with no discussion and no debate. And it was sold on a false pretense that this was a normal actuarial funding criteria and that it had bipartisan support and there would be no trouble paying it. And the ink was hardly dry on that law when the early part of 2007, less, less than a year after it took effect, we get the beginnings of the Wall Street crisis and they began to not be able to pay the bill. And that's when the privatization advocates who wanted to convert the post office into a private regulated monopoly seized on that mistake and hijacked Congress to get basically deadlock and stalemate so that this problem in the 2006 law could not be fixed. And that's where we are today. And just so you know, uh, the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation in 1985 published three major books in that year, has had a conference and every year since has had tens of millions of dollars spent in every uh, five-year cycle on privatizing the post office. And they were waiting for this kind of a crisis. So the combination of a unaffordable pre-funding of retiree health in 2006 and a Wall Street crisis led them to push very hard for privatization. And even in the Obama administration, they were deeply divided on this question of whether to make it a private regulated monopoly or to fully privatize it. President Obama's chief economic advisor was one of the major advocates of full privatization and Vice President Biden's chief economic advisor was the, one of the major foes of privatization. And there was a pitched battle war being fought even within the Obama administration. That's mm. why the 2006 pre-funding issue never got solved. And the Board of Governors could have solved it, but US senators have a right to put in a slip and object to any board of governor appointee and then filibuster the nomination. So that's what Bernie Sanders did to try to save the post office. He did it to three people. They've never had a fully approved postal governor's board. This privatization battle in full pitch battle mode has been playing itself out since 2006. And that's where we are right now in terms of the deficit. There is no deficit at the post office in terms of its ability to operate outside of one third reductions in its volume, which occurred in the Wall Street crisis and it's occurring now. There's no reason to think that the, the post office can't pay its bills and fixing this retiree pre-funding can be done easily in the stimulus um, package with a loan that doesn't have to be repaid except over a long period, basically stretching the liability out the way it should have been originally, the length of the time when the bills are coming due. Um, but that's not going to get solved. So the question really is, how can we get the money they need, the loan authority they need, and just count the losses from having to face this liability. They lost over 220,000 employees over this last 13 years. They've closed half of their postal processing stations. They've been in massive cost cutting. Um, the people who are trying to privatize are trying to degrade the service and make them live within their means when it's impossible for them to do so. Why not instead of continuing to fight the battle on the bigger issues, why don't we just keep the Postal Service bumping along, doing what it does best within its means and let it take in the amount of money it spends and not pay for all the future healthcare liability. And I hope that's the compromise we get to, which is to kick the can down the road and not be in this game of chicken 
or this Mexican standoff with the guns pulled to each other's heads and the guns cocked because everybody's going to lose if, if we don't solve their budget shortfall and we allow this debate to threaten the financial viability of the post office. And the people wanting to privatize are actually very much pushing for that exact outcome. So the mm. people in the Senate have to decide whether in the midst of an economic crisis and a public health crisis and the legitimacy of an election at stake, whether they're willing to go down with that ship. They gotta make that decision. And we gotta tell them that this is not the time to finish this debate that started back in the 70s. Yeah. So, so Patrick, so we have an interesting are, question. Go well, ahead, Rena. Uh, I, I was going to bring really, up a question in chat, uh, but you go ahead. Well, is it Ed's? Because we're going to we're going to get to that. So. Um, I, I would like to say, you know, remind everybody that we always end with um, the, like, the, what are the actions? We're going to, we are going to prevail upon Patrick to tell us <laughs> what actions right. are going to be really important. And that's the very next thing. But I think let's finish. So most of the questions that people asked about the government oversight um, have been covered, except I see two in here that Patrick might want to address. One of them is, does the U.S president have the legal right to dismantle the post office? And the second one is given the appointment of a new postmaster general, what can we do to support the postal workers union? Um, so let me start with the new postmaster general. Um, his name is Louis DeJoy and he spent he, he replaces Megan Brennan. Megan Brennan was a postal carrier for 10 years. She's been with the Postal Service her entire career. Um, she's been Postmaster General for quite some time and a stabilizing force. And she oversaw tremendous changes that really got the post office in these last seven years in a position to, she's been Postmaster General, I think for five years, but she's done an enormous amount of work. Um, David Williams, who is the vice chair of the Postal Board of Governors um, has resigned in protest over the restructuring and some of the things that are being done by the president uh, with regard to how the post office is being run to cost cut. He was helping oversee the vote by mail operation with the deputy postmaster who also resigned. So David Williams resigned April 30th. Um, this other gentleman, uh, deputy postmaster, resigned uh, in the first week of April. And then um, the new postmaster general has for 25 years run a logistics company that advises UPS and has been fully in support of privatizing the post office. He has $25 million invested in that company and that company's value will go up dramatically if the post office is privatized. His wife has $50 million invested. Um, he has no prior experience with the postal service. The two people who were bridging the coalitions to help in Congress put together the support for Congress. And it's very important to say this, Republicans from rural areas in the house have prevented privatization. They've also prevented taking away the monopoly that the post office has, and they've also supported making it affordable to keep that cross subsidy. So um, we're, not, we're not with the leadership that we need in the post office starting June 15th when this uh, DeJoy takes over. He gave $2 million to President Trump, and he coordinated all the fundraising for the Republican National Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we've got a person who's political, whose mission is to privatize the post office, and who has managed to knock out the two people that were instrumental in helping Congress make sure that the post office could handle vote by mail. So we're in the wrong hands right now at the post office. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, so who's going to save us? And I would suggest Congress is going to save us because the post office is too important to lose. And most members of Congress understand that. And most members of Congress realize they've created many of the problems the Postal Service faces. Like they, don't, they do not allow mail delivery 
postal rates to be increased to cover costs that are being incurred by the post office. They peg the cap on the pricing of mail at the consumer product index, which makes no sense. That price cap is artificial and it's below what they need to have the authority to do to raise the price of a post office. So what we're being asked to accept is in 60 or 70% of the country, pay two or $3 for what you now get to send through the mail for 55 cents, just because you live in an area where there's a high cost to deliver the mail. That's what privatization would give you. What Congress has done is made it impossible for the postal service to charge slightly more for regular mail delivery and Congress could easily fix that. Congress could simply bail out the post office knowing that it will get repaid by expanding what the post office can do. And if you want to see the list of what the post office can do, and I think this is really positive, go to 29, my Roman numeral 29 on page 20, which is how can the United States Postal Service thrive without privatizing? And this is the list of all the things that the Postal Union and the consumer groups that are allied with them have asked the Congress to let the Postal Service do. It includes helping with the census, something that the post office could do in a much more aggressive way. It includes um, postal banking. Um, it includes expanding the ability of the postal buildings to become a center for other services they do a very large number of things from passport applications. I gave a list in my materials of the 13 things they want you to know that lists all the services they do, which you don't even know about. But by expanding and protecting people's privacy, but giving them an online portal so that they can send emails and mail and emails that are converted to paper delivery, which is in almost every country but the United States, so let them do digital um, mail services. Electrical charging stations at all US post offices and next to all delivery boxes, because they have the absolute right to locate those things if, they're, if they have statutory authority. Um, they could do notary services at a reasonable cost. They could modernize their fleet with higher fuel economy and lower carbon emissions. Their fleet is completely out of date and past the date when they should have been replaced by more than five years on most of their vehicles um, because they've been trying to get out of their debt. Um, okay, thank you, Patrick. Patrick, can I, can I interrupt a little bit? Because we're, um, there's a certain feeling of urgency about, um, uh, on uh, listeners' part about concrete steps we can take now to, uh, to just, just to support the post office we have so that it will, so it, so it'll allow us to vote by mail in the 2020 election. What, if you could give us three things we can do now as individuals, um, I'm going to take it from your earlier comments right to our Congress people. Our personally, our Congress people are in favor. So I mean, we can still do that. But what, um, what can we do concretely? So to, so to save the post office. Let's let's be very concrete. Um, the yeah. first thing we need to do is have Gary Peters be the hero in getting the Heroes Act passed in the Senate. Now, why do I say that? Okay. He's the leader on the he's the leader on the on this issue in the Senate. He is the Great. most senior member on the Postal Banking Committee. He should be the general calling the shots, and he should be the one telling us what to do. Okay. But a grassroots Great. army, a grassroots army who flips the script on what we're being told is how we save the post office. We're told it's failing financially, it's not. We need to make sure people know that. We're told it costs too much and it has unreliable service and it's inefficient, it's not. We've been told that privatization will maximize consumer welfare, but it's plainly wrong and we need to be able to tell members of Congress what Trump is asking us to do through his Secretary of the Treasury which many in the Republican Party are deathly afraid that he'll get the votes to do, and they don't want it. The people who represent rural areas, the senator from Alaska who stood behind Trump in the White House. So it's going to take a rural coalition with lots of Republican senators and House members, 
It's going to take a consumer coalition of people who value the post office and can tell their member of Congress. It's gonna take lots of petitions. There were 450,000 signatures presented by the main group that advocates for the social security program, Social Security Works. Mm -hmm. AARP is involved in this. Um, now, what's, what's going to make this a more difficult issue? Well, my answer is the thing that will get us to uh, get all the Democrats in the Senate to vote for it will also make it a more difficult issue. So by making it a purely partisan matter, which is only about saving the elections, plays into this idea that this is not a bipartisan necessity at this time. No one wants to have to vote in person and get sick or bring it home and make some member of their family get sick and die. Nobody wants to lose the freedom of voting absentee if they could possibly get it. And yet that issue has been politicized and is viewed as a partisan issue. What will save the US post office is taking it and dialing it back from that partisan divide and allowing for the normal coalitions that have saved the post office to date to be restored in the Congress. Now, DNC, Tom Paris is making this hard because they're making this a flagship issue. They're sending out millions and millions of pieces of mail on the postal bailout and making it all the bad Republicans. But the truth is the Republicans have saved the post office time and time and time again. There are people in both parties who've been advocating privatization. And this is as much an issue about breaking the one public union in the federal government. And that has not been a strong Republican issue because 650,000 workers all but 120,000 of whom have full union rights and are permanent employees and they have only 1% attrition, they're in all these communities all over the country. Mm -hmm. And Republican members don't attack the postal union. They just don't. So what we have to do as the groups, if you go and you look who is supporting bailing out the post office, the NAACP has done that because this has been a huge source of employment and the Postal right. Union has been a leader on racial equity and justice in the employment sector, um, making the union very fair on race issues, much more so than before the union. Uh, women's groups have valued the post office because women have gotten all kinds of opportunities within the post office in their employment and they make up a large percentage of the employees in the post office. So we have to tap into all the different groups. I gave this document to this group because I don't have an exact answer on which grassroots coalition will form, but let me make this really clear. They killed the post office expansion into Staples. It was successful. They delayed getting rid of Saturday banking for seven years. They stopped the closing of 13,000 post offices, mostly in rural communities. Um, I could go through all the battles that have been won. This is just same shit, different day. We have to win this battle again, which means everybody has to start thinking about why they love the post office and learn enough so that you know when you're being lied to about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have, a, we have a concern expressed here, and I think that, I mean, this sounds right to me, that if the post office is privatized, we'd end up uh, with the equivalent of internet deserts. Um, <laughs> You know, this is exactly right. Think, Winifred, right. Winifred Gallagher talks about this. She says the Postal Service gave us the model for communications networks that cover the whole country. And when the telegraph came in, there was a war over whether we'd have something like the post office. We didn't get it. When the phone company came in, um, there was an attempt to make sure everybody had access to it. When the Internet came in, there was an attempt to make sure everyone had access to it. Instead of getting something like the post office in any one of those three instances with those three new technologies, we got massive digital deserts, massive yeah. telecommunications deserts, people who were cut off. Now, Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't tolerate this, and he passed a rural electrification program. He passed a program to subsidize building out the electric utilities to the whole country. He passed a program to regulate the telephone industry and make sure we subsidize it heavily so everyone could have access to a phone. And he created this regulated utility model. So what we have to do to push back on the full privatization advocates, which is the Trump treasury plan and some people in the Democratic Party pushing for it as well, and the Cato Institute, all the big money people who are gonna make money off it in Wall Street, the real estate developers, 
the people who will get into this and cherry pick off the profitable areas. We push back by saying full privatization should be off the table and shutdown should be off the table because then a creditor will take a public asset and devalue it and it'll be a fire sale. The only two things we should even consider are a public regulated monopoly under a different structure and this current structure is broken and I've made it clear, I think that the post office is being regulated poorly by Congress and Congress is creating many of its problems or we could have a private regulated monopoly and we're being offered none of that in this debate. The only country to go to full privatization is no country and the only country to go to a private regulated monopoly is New Zealand, which is, has 25 people competing with the public remaining service, which is falling apart. You can go study it. Wow. So, yeah, so if you want to have a private regulated monopoly, you'd have to follow some version of Japan or the United Kingdom or Germany. And the public owns huge shares of all of those. The public regulates them. And we're not even having that debate. Could it be so treated as a public utility? That's exactly the point. That's the okay. only alternative oh, to the right. current structure. Thank you to Taz. I think he brought that up in the chat. Said, can we just treat this as a public utility? So how do we advocate right. for that? <laughs> so, so the reason why a public utility model um, has not uh, been advocated for is because it hadn't been tried anywhere in the world until 2007 in Japan. Japan has special reasons with all of its publicly paid for pu public transport and its densely packed cities and all kinds of reasons why they were able to convert over and regulate it and let the private actors in. We've done something similar to that kind of integration already and if we educate ourselves about the degree to which the private carriers are already collaborating and working closely, we can work it out without a major sell-off of assets. Um, the UK has done this in such a limited way that it's very close to what we're doing already. Um, we just have our postal service classified as a government corporation, but Congress is regulating it poorly we could do better job with how we limit their rate making we could make the postal regulatory commission work better we could we could set up a different way of appointing members of the governing board the only country that has any model other than the new zealand full privatization is germany and germany did what part of the trump plan is is move all the postal services into private malls private retail locations um, and for a whole bunch of reasons, we can't do that because the scale is so great. The total miles covered, the total number of buildings, the total number of zip codes, 42,000, the total population, the volume of mail. The volume of mail in the United States is 47% of all the world's mail. We have That's overseas amazing. operations that are enormous. The scale will not work. So, so this of really... This is really a small potatoes issue about properly governing this government corporation that operated well within the new structure created in 1970. Maybe yeah. we have a debate about getting rid of the union. They wanna cut pay by half. They wanna cut benefits by half. They wanna take away the job security. It's a fight about killing unions. And when yeah. this union was created in 1970, 28% of the workforce was unionized. Now it's below 6%. Most of the unions are public unions, the majority. This still is about killing unions as well as fun, you know, funding Wall Street and helping real estate developers. And we really ought to be smart about where the big money's coming from to tell us these things. I would sit down with postal workers, rural Republican congressmen, people in rural communities who live and die by the post office. And that's where the solution lies. That's the okay. poll. Everybody is worried. I mean, like everybody is worried about the timeline here because we're in May and the elections in November. And um, we're very worried about 
steps for right now? I mean, this is like, we need a turnaround now. And so one of the things I'm wondering, you mentioned all of these coalitions of groups. Are there a couple of coalitions that you can recommend where we can, like are, are people doing postcard campaigns? Are people doing calling campaigns? Does it How, really matter if you buy stamps? There's um, right. a lot of people asking if these stamp buying campaigns are just a drop in the bucket or if it's worthwhile, you know, let, what, what can we do? We got six months, what can we do? What can we do specific, like wh who can we call tonight or who, what, what URL can we clock into tonight and say, put me on, put me on the list, I'll make some phone calls or write so, some postcards. So moveon.org had a petition that they sent to President Trump. The rural, there's, there's something in my materials called the Rural Organizing Action Network. Okay. They published a letter. Um, they had over 200,000 rural residents demanding a fully funded postal service from every single congressional district. Um, they had over 30,913 letters sent. They're looking to send 51,000 more. You know, Debbie Stabenow is connected deeply to all of these communities. Her role on the Agriculture Committee is really important. This will be decided in the Senate. I think yeah. that we need, if, if, and I'm talking about mayors, I'm talking about county clerks, city clerks, township clerks, all the good government groups, all the election advocacy groups, if we want what we were able to do as a state in passing Prop 2 to end gerrymandering, and we want a census that's complete, we need a strong postal service. If we want the absentee ballot, no excuse, new right that we got in Prop 3 to be fully implemented, we need a strong postal service. All of the groups in that coalition really need to have a meeting with Senator Stabenow and Senator uh, Peters and to make sure that they're on the same page with what the Board of Governors asked for, which is $75 billion, $25 billion of which is absolutely essential to keep them out of bankruptcy. The $10 billion loan's not enough. They're going to need another $10 billion loan and raise the loan limit. Make sure we're all on the same page. And I think people have to put together a coalition to put pressure, and it should come from the grassroots. And I think it's really, really important. Yeah. It's I an existential everybody... threat, and it's been created as an issue unnecessarily, yeah. and stalemate and deadlock wins. If they can mm -hmm. deadlock and stalemate and block, they win. So conceivably, the league of the Michigan League could be in touch with the senators, our senators. And, and, uh, and those senators have to tell you who the targets are. Right. Where is the coalition? You've got to count the votes. You've right. Got to, and it's going to, this is a must pass. And the problem right. is, let's just be honest about the problem. The problem is that over $3 trillion plus an additional $4 trillion in lending went out the door. Um, very high percentage of it to, to help businesses with their insolvency, some small part to help local governments, no. um, a lot to the health sector, um, not enough to help families with income support or, or eviction prevention support. All of the things that help individuals are in the current bill. The current bill is very, very good, but it's not tied to these powerful interests who've already gotten their money and walked out the door with it. The postal service bailout needed to be in the first four bills. We're right. in a very weak leverage position. Right. I'm just throwing that out there, which means there has to be a very strong campaign. All right. the senators I, I think who are going to block it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, um, somebody says, uh, Rita says, why not ask the uh, National League to, uh, to engage in the coalition as well, which certainly, I mean, the League is, how, is, is a powerhouse. Maybe we can mobilize the league. I, I was on Zoom calls, um, and there were three of them, and I listened to all three presidents of the Postal Union. I listened to a bunch of grassroots groups from rural farm communities. Um, I, their discussion about all of this is how I was able to distill much of what I said, but I then also had to read. Um, I don't think the issues are complicated, and I think that defining the issue as supporting an institution that's at the foundation of responding to the pandemic and talking right. about the health kits being delivered to your house, talking about how people are using package delivery now more than any, that the package delivery right. is up, all these things. And ultimately, um, you know, 
a very simple thing is read the stories on Amazon and their warehouses in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey and how many of their workers got sick. And then look at the statistics on how many workers in the Postal Service got sick. They have managed worker safety and ultimately that's made their operations more efficient. They get a lot of high marks on a lot of different metrics. Mm -hmm. And the whole defunding of the post office is based on tearing them down. So if we want them to survive, we have to build them up and tell some truth about the Postal Service. Yeah. Okay. Hug a postal service person today. Oh, wait, from six feet away, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Give them some love. Blow them a kiss them. through right. the mask. So I hope I this was helpful. Very you. much so. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. I think everyone really appreciates it. I think. Um, I think uh, this is this is the postal. I think we all agree that the U.S. Postal Service is a and, and its survival and thrive its ability to thrive is going to be a pillar really important pillar of democracy so um i want to thank you for joining us i want to thank uh jesse and some of the other league people working behind the scenes um to uh, make this happen and i want to thank everybody for coming inside and sitting in front of their computers <laughs> <laughs> on a beautiful, on a beautiful night and we look forward we can stay on the <laughs> line for a little bit longer if you want to type some more questions to patrick in the chat but um thank you again everybody and hopefully we'll see y'all we'll see you oh wait we have another event um our next event is june Teresa, 17th june, june 17th. 17th with the author of the book how democracies die his name is Stephen Levitsky, and he'll be joining us on June 17th, also by Zoom. And uh, that, that link will be going out in the next day or two. That's right. And remember that uh, Patrick wanted to share his research document with us, and so that's on the League's website. Um, it, it was also posted in the chat. I can post it again in the chat. And this event was also recorded. And so you can, if you want to share it with others, um, that will be available shortly. So, all right, cheers and good night, everyone. Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. That was my pleasure. And thank you, Jesse. Who's thank no, you, Jesse. No one, no one has seen, but he's the wizard behind the curtain, only he's a real one. So, <laughs> I think if people want to stay on, we can um, unmute. Uh, for a chat. Okay, and I'm putting it in the chat.